Hello Sector Watchers, welcome to this special episode of Sector Spotlight. In this version, I want to talk you through the way I use relative rotation graphs as a tool to build portfolios from a top-down approach, using a top-down approach. Please enjoy the show and let me know what you think in the comments below. Using RRGs, relative rotation graphs, as a tool for a top-down approach to build portfolios. That was the first, that was the initial way I intended to use relative rotation graphs. It was the way I used my research at the time when I was working on the sell side to come up with trading ideas and sector weightings, overweighting, underweight calls for my institutional clients. So I was coming in from a high level, breaking it down through sectors, etc. Over time, that process has evolved a little bit more and um, I now start at a higher level in the pyramid, uh, at an asset class level. And what I want to do here is talk you through my framework of going from asset classes to individual stocks and see what else is there outside the stock market that might have our interest or might interest us to, to get a position in, in a portfolio. And also show you the tools and the, the, that we have available on stockcharts.com and that we can use to actually go through this routine. Okay, so we start at the very high level um, from an asset class level. And pretty much every investor, whether you're retail, professional, semi-professional, institutional, everybody starts with, I always call it a big bag of money. You get, you got a big, you got a bag of money, and and you need to decide what you're going to do with it. Now, that means that the first question that you need to answer is, in which asset class or in which mix of asset classes you want to go invest. And there, if you if you look at asset allocation pieces nowadays, you people make make asset make asset classes as broad as possible and I don't necessarily agree with that I think there's only a few asset classes and then you can break that further down and let me show you what I mean the asset class the various asset classes that I use in my work in sector spotlight and in the blogs that I write I, I decide among um, six seven asset classes um, from left to right, there is real estate, and that is um, can be listed real estate or or bricks and mortar. For ease of purpose, I potentially use listed real estate. So what, what we can trade through REITs or ETFs or something. Then there's government bonds. There is high yield bonds. Obviously, there is stocks. And then there is the US dollar, because I, I really do feel that cash is also an asset class. And then you have commodities and you have corporate bonds. I think that pretty much every other part of the market can be ranked among one of these asset classes. Now, we can use an RRG to look at these levels of the market. And let me bring up the site for you so we can work with that and we have when we have the RRG you can go to asset allocation and here you will find the exact same asset classes as I just showed you on that slide and you can see the rotation of those asset classes over time and it can, we can use it, we can, we can make it help us decide which asset classes are interesting enough for us to invest in. Obviously, you can do this on a weekly basis, you can do it on a daily basis. Now, because asset allocation is not really something that you wildly trade in, 
I prefer to use the weekly setting, the weekly time frame to look at the rotation of these asset classes. Um, the benchmark that I use here is VBINX, that's the Vanguard Balanced Index Fund. That's the traditional 60-40 balanced index portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And the bond section consists, is an aggregate, so it's government, uh, corporate and high yield, so it's a selection of bonds. So pretty much stocks, government bonds, high yield and corporate bonds are in that benchmark. Now you see that we have added uh, real estate and commodities. That means that this is an open universe. So there, the, the, the asset classes, the tails on the image are broader than the benchmark. That means that these extra tails, these extra asset classes, so DJP, GSG, and V&Q, gives the possibility to create alpha over our benchmark. Of, obviously, you know, being correctly weighted in the stock and bond sections will help, but adding asset classes, securities that are not in the benchmark, give you an extra option to create alpha over your benchmark. So this is the RRG that I would use at the highest level, at the asset class level, to decide whether I want to invest in stocks, in bonds, in corporate bonds, etc. And maybe in what sort of mix, because you don't have to pick one. It's an asset allocation. It's a mix. You can, you can create a portfolio that has allocation to various asset classes. As a matter of fact, it's actually a pretty good idea to have a portfolio that is uh, spread out over various asset classes. Now, one of the things that you uh, may have seen me do, uh, or, or maybe not, is that I like to split my screen in two to have the RRG on one side and to have my chart, my normal chart, on the other side. And my, my regular chart, my go-to chart, is a weekly bar chart, as you see it here on the top, and it is the ratio line, so the, I, I call that raw relative strength of the security that I'm looking at, uh, and this is versus SPY, and we're looking at asset classes, so I need to change this to VBINX asset classes. So now we have the bar chart, and we have relative strength versus VBINX, and we have the RRG lines. These two things, these two charts, help me decide at an asset class level. The asset class group is available as a drop-down. Just go to the group selection, you pick asset allocation, and here it is. And you obviously you can you can create a chart list that holds all these uh, ticker symbols. With this is my go-to chart, but you can create it for your own chart. Now let's move back to the framework here. Once we've decided where to invest at an asset class level, we can go down one notch, um, or a half notch I should say, because if we stick with, let's, let's take it from a US point of view, not make it like super international, maybe for stocks. The government bond section can be broken down in the yield curve, or bonds with various maturities. You can, you, you, you can invest in a general ETF f goft which encompasses all government bonds, or you can go into separate maturity, shorter or longer dated bonds on the yield curve. For the stock market, you can go to SPY, or you could go to growth, value, you could go small caps, mid caps, large caps, uh, you could do everything, or you can put US stocks in perspective to international markets. And then in the commodity basket, you can you could decide to pick one or more individual sub-indexes. So like precious metals, industrial metals, livestock, that kind of stuff. If we, if we stick with those three, because uh, corporate bonds, high yield bonds, uh, these are pretty sophisticated asset classes if you want to invest 
in single named high yield bonds or single name corporate bonds. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's very good business. A lot of people do it, but you definitely that's a more in that knowledge that's needed to um, to actually know what you're doing in those asset classes. So I'm happy, a happy user of um, HYG and LQD for so HYG here and LQD the ETFs to cover exposure to those asset classes. And real estate, I use V and Q. Um, or inside uh, stocks, you could use XLRE. But at an asset class level, I like to use V and Q um, because it's just an easy way to get exposure to that asset class. If we break down, if we go to one level lower and we break down the yield curve, then there are uh, basically six maturities that are covered by ETFs on the yield curve. And we actually do have those available uh, on the system. <clears throat> so if you go again to the drop down box and you scroll all the way down to US bond maturities and US yield curve. So let me bring up US bond maturities here and let me do uh, RIG general and bring up the yields here. I changed that recently following the comment from one of our viewers uh, and I, it actually made sense. So on the left hand side you now have the ETFs that represent the various maturities on the yield curve and on the right hand side you see the various sections in yields. So that's the reverse basically. They both give you a pretty good handle of what's going on. Um, from an asset allocation perspective, I like to use the ETFs because they, um, they are investable instruments. So if we look at this and we toggle through it, you see, so this is the really short term stuff. This is, uh, so Bill is one to three months. Shy is one to three years. IEI is three to seven years. The benchmark here is GOLF, which is all of those. And then we've got IEF, which is 7 to 10. We've got TL, TLH, which is 10 to 20. And we've got TLT, which is 20 plus years. Now this RRG at this point in time, and it's, um, it's December, uh, halfway through December, you can see that the shorter dated maturities are inside the leading quadrant and the longer dated maturities are inside the lagging quadrant. That means that shorter dated bonds are going up. So yield is going down for the shorter dated bonds. And on the longer end, um, the prices are going down and the yields are going up. So this represents, this type of setup represents a steepening of the yield curve. So at the shorter end, yields go down, at the longer end yields go up, that's called the steepening of the yield curve. And you see that uh, on this side in the yields as well, albeit in a slightly, um, it's, it's a little bit less clear, um, but um, you can see, so if we go here to the really short stuff, so three months, six months, and then we've got one year, two year, you see that they're all in lagging, which is, you know, you've got to flip it. So, so the, the shorter yields are going down. And then when we move to, um, where is my, so here is uh, five years, seven years, 10 years, and then there is 30 years and 20 years. So there's a little, there's a little, little, blip in that curve. So we can't really see that here, but here you can see that there's a, there's a little little blip. Um, I'm not going into that right now, right here. So let's stick with the uh, with the longer ended uh, bonds, uh, or so, sorry, the, uh, the ETFs that represent um, that asset class. And what it means is that it, at this point in time, for the bond section, so for the part of your portfolio that is that you want to allocate to bonds, you could potentially say that at this point in time, you should prefer the shorter dated maturities on the curve. So that is how you can break down the government bond part 
into various maturities using various ETFs and make a selection and decide that the allocation in your portfolio that goes to government bonds should be allocated to shorter term bonds. So we have now made up our mind here and we have made up our mind that in the yield curve we should be at the shorter end. Now let's go to the commodity section. If you want to pick up some commodities then you may want to uh, dive into the commodity basket and we also have that as a predefined group on the system. So we have all the way here commodities and we have the GSCI breakdown. So the GSCI commodity family as a breakdown. And you can see here that uh, GNX, which is the index that underlies GSG, is the benchmark. And we have agriculture, industrial metals, precious metals, energy, livestock as the subgroups. And this RRG can help you to decide if you want to specified a little bit more if you want to be more granular with your commodity allocation this RRG can help you make a selection of the right groups and uh, at this point in time I would say that agriculture and industrials are the um, the tails or the ETFs or the subgroups right now that are driving this uh, GNX higher so that's for the commodity part of our portfolio we go back to our framework, then we have here the stock market. Well, the stock market can be sliced and diced in a gazillion ways. <clears throat> One thing that um, I, we have a, a few breakdowns available on the system. So let me bring this back. And if we go here, then obviously the clearest one and we're going to go there is in sector ETS but I want to show you that we can we have as a predefined group international stock market indexes so this RRG can help you to put the US market in perspective to what's going on internationally and the benchmark here is the Dow Jones global index that's that's an index that tracks all stock markets in the world and if you can see here, SPX is inside the lagging quadrant, which means that there are other markets around the world that are actually performing better than the S&P 500. And what it tells you is that sometimes it might be a good idea to not only focus on SPY or the S&P, but also maybe not for a big part of your portfolio, but just make some allocations to international markets. And we've got a ton of ETFs available um, that you could use to create exposure to international markets. What you may notice is that I'm using um, uh, the dollar, so the indexes, the underlying indexes to track international markets. And the reason for that is that the ETFs are all quoted in US dollars. And that means that if a foreign market is trading in, let's say, in the UK, in pounds, or in Europe, in euros, or in Japanese yen, or uh, Russian rubles, or uh, Indian rupees, that the ETF inherently has a currency component in there. And that sometimes distorts the rotation and the image. So my approach is to look at the international rotations through or by using indexes and once I've decided that I would like to have exposure to a particular market go to the ETFs and find the ETF that provides me with the exposure to my desired market if I want to be really correct I can also take a look at an RRG that tracks currencies versus the US dollar which we also have. So here's the T10 FX with the US dollar as the base. And this can help us decide whether, and maybe you don't want to go that route because it can be complicated, but it gives you a good idea of whether exposure to foreign markets 
will help you. So if the foreign currencies are outperforming the US dollar, you have a double whammy because you've got the good exposure from the stock market and you've got a currency exposure that beats the US dollar. So you can gain on, on, on two fronts. And that's what's happening here. So if you look at this chart here, this is the G10 currencies against the US dollar. And the US dollar is here in the center. So this shows us that over the last, this is going on for a couple of weeks already. So here the US dollar is in the top right. So it's, it's, it's leading. And you see that that whole complex of currencies, that whole G10 is beating the US dollar. A little bit of setback and we're now rolling back up and, and as you know these curling up inside weakening is actually pretty strong so picking a stock market that is outperforming the US will give you also a very likely a positive attribution from your currency exposure now here's the RRG for the, for the international markets um, we have SPY here is it slightly down so it's here and you can see that there are markets that are actually doing pretty good so um, the one that I can see here is Indonesia uh, or Japan and Nikkei which is just rolling coming back into leading had a little bit of a dip here and it's now moving moving right there um, so here Korea Kospi curling back up so this this RRG can give you a pretty good handle and ideas about potential foreign markets that can help you uh, beat the S&P 500 and be an addition to your portfolio. Now, so we have the international one. We can also go into the growth value slice and dice. So here we can decide what do we want to go with growth or value. So we could, it, it, there are many ETFs that represent the growth section and the value section. So if you don't want to go too deep in the investment pyramid and you want to stop here but you want to have a little bit more flavor in your um, stock allocation you could decide for value or growth stocks and just stop there it's no problem um, or you could go to a size breakdown so that means um, large cap mid cap small cap and as you can see here at this point in time um, there's a very clear split. So small caps and mid caps are outperforming large caps. So you could stop here. You could allocate money to small caps and mid caps and avoid large caps. And with that, potentially outperform the, the S&P 500 or the, 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 um, the broader market, the broader stock market. Lots of ways that you can actually uh, break down and slice that, uh, that market and make it into your portfolio depending on how granular you want to go of course if you just want to stay with with the s&p just so have an allocation in stocks just buy spy stop there don't do anything else and just play around with the asset allocation totally fine so every level in that pyramid gives you a little bit more granularity in building your portfolio now the last one if you want to go one step further there is the, um, the group that breaks down growth, value, and size all in one. So we can have growth and value, we can have large, mid, and small caps, but we also have small cap growth, small cap value, mid cap value. And that's what this chart is showing you. So here we have this, this universe. So growth and value both sliced and diced into um, various segments of the market. So you can be a little bit more granular than just growth and value or just sizes. And what you see here um, very clearly is that especially large caps and growth, and growth and by definition growth large cap are underperforming while the rest is doing pretty good. Um, again, this could be the end point of your stock allocation. Let's go back to the pyramid and take it one step further. So we can go to the uh, various sectors. And I'm sure that if you have watched Sector Spotlight or if you've read uh, one of my blogs in the RRG blog or any one of the other commentators, a lot of people are talking about uh, individual sectors. All these XLB, XLC, these are very popular tools for, <coughs> for a lot of market participants 
to build their portfolios. And you may have noticed that we do have those available on the drop down box on the RRG page, probably the most used RRG, showing you the rotation of all these sectors around the S&P 500. And this RRG <coughs> can help you to actually pinpoint the sectors where you want to be invested, or maybe even better, uh, make sure that you avoid the sectors that are big underperformers and where you should not be invested. This is the most popular RRG there is. And of course, uh, the way I like to do it is bring, uh, for example, uh, XLY, going here in weakening, bring it on the chart and have my go-to chart with the bar chart, the uh, relative strength and the RRG lines to make up my mind and decide which sectors I would like to invest in. And then finally, we have the last level of this framework and those are individual stocks and now we've worked our way all the way from asset classes making sure we have an allocation to bonds maybe commodities corporate bonds real estate stock market maybe with a little bit of international flavor or growth value into sectors and then if we really want to go granular we can go into a selection of individual stocks and as you know, we have those available as well. You can go into, let's say, the financial sector and make up your mind about the rotation of these financial stocks against XLF, against the sector index, and pick, the, pick a few stocks that can make it to your portfolio. You can do that in many, many ways. Maybe you want to have a top three or a top five stocks in every sector. So you have the top five stock, uh, top five stocks in every sector, which means that you would have a 50, 55 individual name portfolio. Or if you have selected only five sectors and you pick the top five stocks, you have 25 stocks in your portfolio. There's many ways you can break that down into uh, individual names in your portfolios. Um, I hope this way of looking at things helped you to get an idea how you can use RRGs as a top-down approach, as a tool for a top-down approach to break down the market from a very high level all the way down to individual names in your portfolio and you can, you can use that uh, in combination with ETFs for higher level asset allocations all the way down to individual stocks. Anyway, if you have any questions about this, please don't hesitate to, uh, to send me a message. My mailbox is open. Um, I will respond to those messages. And if there are good messages and, and or good questions, I'll be happy to deal with them uh, in a mailbag segment in Sector Spotlight, because I think that especially the higher level asset allocation stuff is very often overlooked by a lot of uh, private investors and there's a lot to gain to, uh, to just be a little bit smarter um, with your um, with your asset allocation and your potentially your your uh, risk management in your portfolio I hope you liked the video if you did give us a like if you've got any questions either in direct email or a comment in the section below uh, and I hope to talk to you soon bye bye Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.